Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session, Code Summarization. Uh, I am your session chair, Xiaohua Wang, uh, from New Jersey Institute of Technology. In this session, we are going to have six talks, uh, all relevant to linking natural and programming languages. Uh, all right, so let's start our session by welcoming our first presenter, Prefer from UCL. Uh, he's going to present his, uh, his two poses. Prefer, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Profir Burtzaki, and I will be presenting POSIT. This is joint work with my supervisor, Earl Barr, and my co-authors, Santa Nadash and Christoph Choide. POSIT is an approach and a tool for segmenting and tagging mixed text. But what is mixed text? Well, let's consider this uh, Linux kernel uh, mailing list email. Here, we can see developers mixing English and code terms. Such text is mixed text. And off-the-shelf natural language toolkits are built with monolingual text in mind and tend to be less accurate when working on these mixed texts. So let's now consider this sentence. POSIT solves two tasks. The first is to separate English from code. Here it identifies two code terms, real, which is in code, quotes, and copy instruction, which is not. Heuristics would work here, but in general, vocabulary overlap between English and code would have trouble identifying real. The second task for POSIT is tagging each token with it for English part of speech and for code AST tags. The English post tagging task is an initial step for other more advanced analysis, such as dependency parsing, while the AST tags provide the function of code tokens in code. Mixed text is ubiquitous. It is present on software fora, software artifacts, mailing list. So POSIT borrows concepts from context switching literature in linguistics and applies it to segment and tag mixed text. We realize it as a neural network trained on uh, data from Stack Overflow flow. Sorry, Stack Overflow posts and time combinations of Android projects. POSIT indirectly aims to help develop developers by helping toolsmiths make tef, um, tools that are mixed text aware. And there we go. POSIT's neural network is composed of three main parts. First, it concatenates three embeddings, a word level embedding, which is here, a bile STM over characters and a bile STM over feature vector. It then passes it through a word level by LSTM. And we combine the forward and backward pass to obtain the embedding for the final sentence. This is done on a sentence basis. This is then duplicated. And on the top, we pass it through a single layer of nonlinearity. And then we softmax it to obtain tag transition probabilities. While on the bottom, we pass it through a two layer perceptron, which we then softmax and obtain language transition probabilities. To decode our tags, we use a conditional random field layer. Here we demonstrate it on language segmentation. Our CRF layer is linear, in effect, a Markov chain. Thus, our problem is to decide the most likely sequence for a hidden Markov chain, where the transition probabilities are populated from our neural network. So to obtain the sequence, we employ the Viterbi decode algorithm. Assuming we know the optimal sequence after a token, we consider the last tr transition that is optimal for the last token we are building upon. We use the CRF layer so we can condition tags on previously chosen tags. For the experimental setup, we train POSIT on two labeled corpora. We then use STORM, pioneering work on mixed text, to baseline it. And we adapt its output to use it for our experimental setup. To show the utility of POSIT for downstream tasks, we combine it with TaskNav and show that the combination improves recall. Here we show the descriptive statistics of our corpora. To construct our code comments corpus, we gather snippet comment pairs from Android projects, Clang labels the code tokens, and LTK labels the English. We use the code comments to weekly label stack overflow. We use the HTML formatting hints to separate code from English. Then we use an LTK to label English, and we use the closest match in code comments to label the code. Consonal et al. are the mixed text pioneers. Their tool, Stormed, uses an island grammar to handle Java snippets surrounded by natural languages. It relegates English to water and parses the Java snippets. They provide Storm both as a web service and as a parse corpus of Stack Overflow Java posts. Storm solves a different but related problem to POSIT. Both segment mixed text. Storm parses the Java, but leaves the natural language for other tools to consider. To compare Storm with POSIT, we preprocess its input and adapt its output. We align any formatting hints from HTML of Stack Overflow posts, and we map the parents of terminals in Storm's Java ASTs to POSIT's tag set. We use POST tagging uh, in the usual sense with an LTK to pr process the English. On language segmentation, we see Storm that achieves 71% balanced accuracy. On the same Java post, POSIT achieves 81.6% balanced accuracy. On post-AST tagging, 
Storm achieves 61.9%, while POSIT achieves 85.6%. We remark again that POSIT solves a related but not identical problem. Turning to POSIT beyond just Java and the commonly used together XML and JSON, we can see that POSIT achieves high 90s over the two core priorities was trained on. Let's now consider how POSIT can help other tools, in particular TaskNav. TaskNav is a tool by Troy Data that extracts tasks, tasks from software documentation. It employs rules to identify tasks from a dependency tree parts of an English sentence. Constructing these it requires sentences decorated with part of speech text. But mixed text often mislead off the shelf post taggers. To mitigate this problem, TaskNav employs heuristics and manual annotations. Posit jointly segments and tags sentences. We can use both results to help TaskNav. The segmentation can augment or replace the manual heuristics. The tagging result can be directly used in dependency analysis. To integrate with TaskNav, we make Posit a REST server, and we call this joint system TaskNav++. To assess TaskNav++, we deployed it on a uniform sample of 30 Linux kernel mailing threads from August 2018. Two authors manually assess the results, and we found 97 new tasks, of which 65 were reasonable. Inspecting the tasks extracted, we can see that Posit helped um, with tokenization. File names which would have their extension separated out by a traditional tokenizer are kept intact. And mention use of code terms, as we've seen in the example in earlier slides, was kept separately correctly as a single entity. This was also a double-edged sword, sadly. It introduced noise in TaskNav suggestion by hiding divs and file paths under a single token. We speculate a more granular approach to formal languages will get POSIT and TaskNav past this limitation. To conclude, POSIT aims to help developers indirectly. We hope it will help toolsmiths produce better tools. Mixed text is ubiquitous in software development. Handling it well can aid tasks, tasks and traceability. POSIT's code-aware POS tagger may improve precision. For comprehension, POSIT's separation of code in English may speed and ease comprehension by enabling navigation that separately handles code in English. For knowledge extraction and ontologies, here too, POSIT segmenter can offer the chance to analyze code and English in mixed text by different means. POSIT is freely available at this link. Feel free to scan the QR code. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you for the good talk. Um, are there any questions with this paper? I don't see it in the in the clutter um, in the clutter um, chat. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, I see. I see one uh, one question. So the question is, what do you use as the word in bending? So we train the word embedding with the system as we train it uh, throughout. We don't use anything that's pre-trained. Uh, perhaps using a pre-trained one, say on a corpus that mixes Wikipedia with uh, software artifact, because using just Wikipedia wouldn't work too well, could uh, help pause it. But we haven't tried that. Any more questions from the audience? No, I do have one question about uh, also about the sure. bending. Uh, I'm very sure. interested in that. So, uh, you got work. You did uh, you, you did combine three embeddings. One is the word embedding and character embedding and also uh, feature embedding. So, can you talk a, yes. a little bit more about that? Like how um, so um, how did you combine them and why you come up with these three embeddings? So the three embeddings are to consider different aspects. So uh, the word level embedding is the traditional one. It's the one you typically use. You just project the words into a high dimensional space. You have your fixed vectors. The character level one, it's to allow the network to learn morphological features of words that could distinguish a code from English. So say snake case, camel case, uh, presence of non-alphanumerical characters in the word itself. These things could be learned by the character by LSTM. Because the LSTM that was at the word level is repeated at the character and feature level as well. The feature vector is a collection, it's a one-hot encoding of heuristics that are often used by humans when building systems to distinguish uh, code from English. So specifically, is this snake case with a regex? Is this camel case with a regex? Um, is the title case? Does it contain numbers? Does it contain symbols? This is all encoded in one, one hot vector. And then we buy LSTM over that 
to allow the network to learn the co-occurrences of these features. And then to use it throughout the system, we concatenate all the three together. And now our representation is basically a word ID, a result of one embedding, a result of another embedding, all mashed together, and we pass it at the sentence level. So now we're learning the presence of words together and what words tend to define what words. Essentially, is this word code? Is it followed by another code token? Is there calling semantics like brackets nearby? Things like this. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. I got, uh, I got one more question from the audience. Um, there are so many few mistakes in your system. And do you have any insight on where, uh, where it goes wrong? <laughs> so yes, we actually have a section dedicated in the paper where we deep dive into closet. And it does go wrong for things like switching back from one token predictions of code. So say you have English and you switch to code for one token. The network usually will have a trail of one, two tokens before it switches back and realizes it should be back in English. So that's a fail case we've observed. Um, we speculate better annotation because we weekly label stack overflow and that's our main training would help. But we haven't explored that yet uh, in detail. Another failing case we've seen is that we don't distinguish all the formal languages on the corpora we test deposit. So when we applied it to the Linux kernel mailing list, it wasn't trained on it at all. So we've actually observed a failure case when we have languages that we didn't build the system for. It still fared pretty well. It had north of 80 accuracy on that corpus, but it has these annoying failure cases. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. We still have one minute. Any question from the audience? No, I, then I have a follow up question on your feature embedding. Maybe you can quickly just uh, uh, like sure. elaborate more on the feature embedding. You talk about like you, you, you came up with the features, right? And how, how mm -hmm. you came up? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I came up with them. It's more mm -hmm. that reading literature, you often see uh, the regexes or the different features that people look for when deciding whether something is code. Oh. So it's more of a collection of things that literature uses mosh together as a one hot embedding. I see, I see. That's awesome, that's awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, thumbs up. Thank you so much. Yeah, so let's move uh, to the second presenter. So the second presenter is, so the second presenter is Jun Jai from Rutgers in New Jersey. Uh, so please stop sh uh, sharing, okay. And um, so uh, she's from uh, Rutgers uh, in New Jersey. Jen, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you for the intro, uh, introduction. Hello, everyone. My, my name is Jun. I'm from Rutgers. I'm going to present our, group, our paper, CPC. This work was done when I was a postdoc at the Purdue. So code comments provide rich information which can be used to help perform various software engineering tasks, such as bug detection. However, developers are less motivated to write comments, making it invisible and error-prone to use comments to facilitate software engineering tasks. This inspires us to provide automation support in maintaining comments. As we know, program analysis techniques propagate information based on program semantics. For example, this, in this piece of Java code, since we want to assign the value of y to the variable x, then x and y must have the same data type. In spite of this, we assume that we can propagate comments of the variable y to the variable x. So we treat comments as first-class objects and use program analysis to propagate comments. With such propagated comments, we have additional semantic hints, and we can use such hints to enrich program analysis. For example, we can detect bugs by cross-checking the code with propagated comments. In this way, we can achieve the goal of code comment co-analysis. This is a typical uh, example. The class array list has an uh, existing comment saying that it permits all elements, including none. In line one, we have a variable all, which is instantiated as an array list instance. So we can propagate the class comment to the variable all. Then in line four, we want to visit each item stored in the variable all. So since all permits none elements, it means that item can be known. So in line five, 
uh, if item is known, we will have a non-point access and thus a non-point exception will be triggered. So from this example, we can see that by propagation, we can pass on comments to code that doesn't have any existing comments. And with the semantics in the propagated comments, we can detect code box. It's well known that there are various kinds of comments. So now the question is whether we can propagate arbitrary comments using a unified rule. Let's look at an example first. These two methods here are code clone. Um, the method at the bottom has two comments. The first one, write a byte to the compressed output stream. This one can be propagated to the method at the top since both of them perform the right operation. Um, the second comment is this method will block until the byte can be written. Actually, this one cannot be uh, propagated. Let's look at the details. Um, in the code at the bottom, the call E method uh, and line eight uh, uses the keyword synchronized to block this method. But uh, in the code at the top, the call E method in line four here actually doesn't have any synchronization mechanism, meaning that this method won't be blocked. So the second comment actually cannot be propagated. So from this example, we can see that even two code snippets are identical. We cannot propagate all the comments between them. Based on our study, we can um, categorize the comments into different groups. For example, uh, the first comment here describes the functionality. The, common, uh, the second comment here describes the property. So before we perform the propagation, we have to construct a comprehensive and fine grade common taxonomy. So this table here shows our common taxonomy. We have two dimensions, the code entities and the content perspectives. The code entity here means elements like classes and the methods. The perspective here means the uh, rationale, implementation, uh, functionality, et cetera. Um, please read our paper for the details of these uh, categories. In order to construct such a taxonomy, we perform a large scale study of comments. Please read our paper for the details of this process. Um, after the taxonomy construction, we have 5,000 labeled comments. With these comments, we will use three algorithms to train classifiers to automatically categorize a comment. We use a decision tree, random forest, and a convolutional neural network. This table shows the results. From this, we can see that on average, both the precision, uh, precision and recall are greater than 0.9, uh, which means uh, the classifiers are effective in classifying comments. Um, given a comment, we will first use the classifiers to get the corresponding uh, code entity and the perspective. Then we will propagate the comments based on the program semantics. Our propagation rules are derived from the program semantics, so they are certain and rigorous. Also, they are generally applicable to all projects. As mentioned before, different code entities and different content perspectives require different propagation rules. So please read our paper for the details of these rules. Now is the evaluation part. We evaluate our approach on five projects. This table uh, shows the results. In total, around um, 41,000 new comments can be derived by propagation. To measure the effectiveness of propagating comments, we manually check the accuracy. We say that a propagated comment is accurate when it's consistent with the source code. Based on our evaluation, our approach can achieve around 88% uh, accuracy. Um, to measure the, use, uh, the usefulness of the propagated comments in helping developers, uh, we perform a user study involving 14 users. To avoid bias, propagated comments and existing comments are mixed together, and thus the users are unaware of whether a comment is propagated or existing. For each comment, we measure three aspects, meaningfulness, consistency, and naturalness. This figure here shows the comparison results from this figure, we can see that our propagated comments align well with existing comments in terms of quality. This table here shows the effectiveness in improving comments. Our approach can infer precise functional com com uh, comments for 87 native methods, which don't have comments or no code. We also detect 12 incomplete comments and 292 wrong comments. Some of them have already been confirmed and corrected by developers. 
This table here shows the uh, effectiveness of our propagated comments in detecting bugs. In total, we detect and report uh, 37 bugs. 30 of them have already been confirmed and fixed by developers. In conclusion, uh, we, conduct, uh, we constructed a comprehensive common taxon taxonomy from different perspectives with various granularity levels. We can achieve a seamless uh, synergy of comment analysis and uh, problem analysis. Our uh, artifact is available. Please follow the link to access our artifact. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? Any questions from the audience? Okay, I have uh, I have one or two questions about about this per, about this paper, but I promise I will read more. Oh, I got um, I got two questions. That's that's wonderful. Um, so the first one is the classifier doesn't look at the position of the comment in the code. Wouldn't this give a strong hint about the kind of code entity it refers to? Uh, no, actually, we don't depend on the positions. We uh, extract uh, uh, at features. These features are used to train the classifiers. The features are extracted from the comment itself. For example, we have a sentence. We will count the number of uh, noun phrases in this sentence. The number is used as a feature. Also, we will extract some features from the um, semantic path tree. So the sample parser can parse a sentence and give us a, a syntax tree. So we will extract some features from this syntax tree and we use these features to trade the classifiers. So the second, the second question I got is, do you have any way to distinguish the helpfulness of comments? Uh, do all comments deserve propagation? Uh, no, actually, uh, we have several categories. Um, not, uh, if, uh, so in our paper, we uh, we have five categories. We have uh, the functionality, we have the implementation details, also we have the property, we have the um, the setup of using our uh, uh, methods, and also we have the rationale. So um, in our approach now, we have propagation rules for three of them. We have we have propagation rules for the functionality, uh, functionality, the property, and the, the implementation details. So not all of them can be propagated. We will use the classifiers to get the category based on different categories. We will use different uh, propagation rules. If uh, if we don't have uh, the corresponding propagation rules, such a comment won't be propagated. Thank you. So. Um Wow, I got more questions. So third one is, is your data set of reported bugs available? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, we have, uh, have the links in our paper. Awesome. Uh, so the next question is, can you elaborate more on the, on the, uh, type, uh, on the uh, uh, um, uh, taxonomy? Taxonomy? Uh, so our taxonomy has two dimensions. The first one is about the code entity. So in the code entity, we have classes, we have methods, we have statements, we have variables. Then in the content perspective, we have the what means uh, functionality. We have the how it's done means the implementation, implementation details. Also, we have the property means, for example, a method, uh, the parameter should be greater than zero. This is a property. Also, we have the, uh, yeah, we have propagation rules for these three categories. We have another two category, the use and the, uh, the use and the others, but we don't have propagation rules for the, the, the other two propagation, uh, the other two categories. Awesome. Um, we still have a little time and there is one last question. So can you use your approach to identify methods on a class diagram as well? Uh, pardon me, please. So could you use your approach to identify methods on a, on a class diagram as well? Class diagram? Yes, so basically uh, can you- We only work on natural language sentence. So uh, given a sentence uh, like uh, insert something into something, we can do this, but we uh, don't treat the class diagrams. 
All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's, uh, mm -hmm. let's move on to the next speaker. Um, so the next speaker is Tin from UT Dallas. So Tin, the floor is yours. You are muted, Tin. All right, thank you. Thank, thanks, David, for the introduction. My name is Tian Nguyen, and I'm from University of Texas at Dallas, and I'm happy to be here today to present to you our research work on suggesting natural method name to check the name consistency. And so first of all, I would like to start by software libraries. And so as you know now today, our own software is built on top of some software libraries and developers, um, they use these application programming interface API to access to the libraries. They often do not look inside the methods and only look at the name of the API to assess the functionality of the libraries. However, I would like to report to you an issue that we call method name inconsistency, where the name of the methods is actually not reflect well the functionality of the method itself. For example, this is the Apache Mina project in the profiler timer future class. There's a method name called get max value. And because the name is so confused, later developers of Apache was renamed it to get maximum time to reflect better the functionality. And also the method name inconsistency not only happened in the first place where people name it, but also when software evolution, where the uh, code was de deviated from the functionality and then deviated from the name of the method itself. And because of these method name inconsistency, that could confuse developers on how to use, how correctly use the libraries and ABI, leading to misuse and defect as reported by many other developers. Um, so it, therefore, in this work, we propose an approach is called MNIR, uh, method name inconsistency and recommendation. Um, and the approach taken to the methods, and it will suggest the method name, for example, get maximum time, and then, to, and then it check to see if the suggested name and the current name are sufficiently similar. And if not, then it will say, hey, it's inconsistency and recommend the alternative name for the methods. Uh, the key idea of the paper in this case is have three phones. The first is we rely on the naturalness of name but at the token level. What I mean by the token level is if you look at the full name, get maximum time, if you break it down into the token, we have get, maximum and time. And the, uh, the, the token of the method names actually repeated and can be captured by the statistical model. The second key idea in our work is we can see that the method name is a sequence of subtoken. It's actually a summary, a extractive summary of the names appear in the body of the methods as well as other context. And that's the key idea of our solution is context. By context, we mean three different contexts. The first one is we call implementation context, which is referred to the body of the method itself. The second context is we call the in interface context, where we talk about the, uh, the type and the name of the argument and the return type of the methods. And the third context is we call enclosing context, where we're talking about the class enclosing the current methods. So, to provide further empirical foundation on whether the context can be helpful in predicting the method name, we're conducting an empirical study uh, on the large scale data set provided by previous researchers and most 17 million methods. And the details in the paper, but I want to summarize the key result we find here. First, the name method name is actually quite unique, you guys. 62.9% of the full method names actually unique. Therefore, if we use our approach that searching for a good name in the previous scene method name in the corpus doesn't work very well. That is the key limitation of existing state-of-the-art approach. However, if we look at the token level in the method name, we actually see quite repetitive. 78.1% of the token actually can be found in the previous scene method name. And if you look at the percentage of the token of the method name in the context that I mentioned earlier, Here's a Venn diagram showing the sharing between those token in the method name and the uh, context. And we see that 65% of the token and method name actually share and can be found in those three contexts. Now you can ask me, what if I don't see any 
those tokens in the, the, the context. Then we computing a social score between the token appearing in the context and the token appearing in the method name. We actually found that the social score very high, indicating that even when the token are not in the context, the token in the context can be used to predict the method, the token and method name. So therefore, we conduct, we can construct the LME approach by taking on the name in the context, such as the implementation context, interface context, and in closing context, collecting them at the sequence and fit into machine learning model from sequence to sequence, and then use it as the abstractive summary to get the sequence of subtoken and build the method name, suggested method name. We compare with the current method name and to see if it's above certain threshold similarity, we report it consistency or not consistent and recommend in the name. We also conducting a um, empirical evaluation on accuracy and certain analysis for the tools. And we use the data set that have been uh, used in the state of the art approach in this area. First is by Leo and other Dixie 2019. Um, and then the second one is the uh, data set provided in code to vec by Alon and other NICLR 2019. Uh, both of that set is large and significant. We split the data set in 10% for testing and 90% for training in both files and project. And note that this data set is different from the data set from our preliminary empirical study that I showed you earlier to avoid a bias. And here's the results. Comparison with Leo 60, 2019, we see that the MNE improvement accuracy from 60% to 69% and more precise and, and uh, the four inconsistency check inconsistency uh, class, 10.4, 10.8% higher in terms of recorded precision for consistency detection, 16.6 and 9% relatively higher in terms of both recorded precision. Comparing to the code to vec, we also consistently improve over that approach by F score from 58 to 67%. And recall improved from 18.2 and precision is 11.1%. Now, the interesting part is we look at our result, we see that 43%, 43.1% of the suggested name that we found is actually matched with developers' um, name when they rename the methods. In other words, we capture pretty well the intention of developers when they rename the methods. Um, we also comparing with the different representation we use instead of just the backup work, we use a, a lexeme, we use abstraction tech tree, we use a graph for the code and then do the prediction. Interestingly, you see that when the representation getting more complex from Lexeme to HD to graph, precision reduced, recon increased a little bit, but the F score actually reduced. Therefore, we conclude that in this, uh, the, the, the name recommendation, the name of the entities are more important or more, more important than the structure of the code. Um, so in other words, the naturalness factor is more a deciding factor in this case than the structure of the code like ASD or graph in deciding. Maybe ASD or graph may be your more useful in code clone detection, but for naming, the name of entities are more important. We also conducted a live study on the real world project to show that our tool is actually useful. So we take our tool run on the open source project that's currently active in GitHub. We detect the inconsistency name and then recommending the alternative name, we make a pull request, total is 50 of them. And then we get back the result from developers to see if they agree or not. And we found that um, 31 uh, out of 42 cases that they returned from 50 case total, the developer agreed that our suggested name are more meaningful than the current name, in which uh, five uh, cases that have been actually merged and 13 other cases have been approved and the others, uh, uh, they agree that that our suggestion is more meaningful, but they did not uh, uh, integrate it yet because of the um, formality and other procedure they need to follow. So in conclusion, what I have been showing you is the approach for the MNIR to suggest natural methods name and check name consistency. Um, we show that the key idea of the naturalness has actually worked well for the token level for the method name uh, we also show that the, uh, using the name is actually more 
uh, effective in recommending name than the structure is the graph. And finally, we show the usefulness of the approach to a real world study. And that's all for my talk and uh, I'm happy to take any question. Thank you. Thank you so much. So any questions from the audience? And I want to remind the audience, uh, you can always ask the questions about the paper uh, using the uh, left panel, uh, sorry, using the left panel in, uh, in, in Clouder. Uh, in in Clouder, uh, you will see a panel on the left side and uh, has a tag Q&A there. You can always post your questions there. So any questions uh, for Tin? Oh, I got one. So does your definition of consistency of method name contain the notion of convention in project level, like a common prefix or rules used in the project? Can, can you read it again, David? The convention, the definition. So the question is asking if the, the, the definition or... So, so the question is about, uh, is about the consistency of the naming checking. Uh, right. whether, whether you use the notion of the convention in project level, like, uh, like uh, the norms used in the, in the projects or common purpose or rules you use in the projects. Do you use that to check the consistency? Uh, that's actually integrated into the learning process. So the convention was actually part, I mean, the learning process, if the convention is uppercase and common case and things like that is also integrated into the learning. So the training data would have something like that and we, the model can learn. Um, so the training part, we take the, tra the some project that the developers uh, modify the name and consider that, you know, they fixing the inconsistency problem and they change the name. So if they having the um, um, naming convention that's not correct, then that would be learned during the, the process as well. Thank you so much. Um, we, we don't have time left of this, uh, um, for this talk, so we have to move to the next one. But I see there is one more question. Maybe you can uh, ask it the question later sure. to, to Tim. So let's move on to the next presenter, Annie uh, from Google. So let me touch sharing again. Yes. Annie, you can start when you are ready. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, so yeah, I'm Annie Lewis, and I'll be talking about where should I, should I comment my code. Uh, I'll be presenting a data set and a model for predicting locations that need comments. Comments are super useful, but uh, how many comments should we write, and where in the code should they be? If you have too many comments, they might use up a lot more developer time, and over time, some of these comments might fall out of date. So it would be really cool to guide developers towards the most useful location. To this end, we propose a new research problem, which is identifying where in the code you should write comments. I'll present a corpus of C code where the comment locations are marked and a machine learning solution that will automatically identify these locations. To train a machine learning model, you need a source of good commenting practice that the model can then emulate. For this, we use the Android open source project. Since it is professionally developed, we consider it as containing good comment location. How would you do this task? One way to do it would be to go through each line in a file and make a prediction as to whether that, li that line should contain a comment or not. Instead, in this book, we make a prediction for a sequence of lines code that forms some logical unit. This brings us to the idea of a snippet, which are code blocks that are limited by MP long. In this file, there are two snippets, one which ranges from lines two to six, and the other ranging between lines eight and nine. Then if there is a comment anywhere within a snippet, we label that snippet with the one, meaning that that is a snippet that should be commented, Alternatively, snippets may receive a label zero. Note that we remove comments, uh, that is a snippet will only contain the actual code lines from the file. Our data contains 41.5 thousand such snippets with binary labels, and this is our main data set. I'll present our best model now, uh, the rest are in the paper. 
This one is a hierarchical neural network. Say we want to make a prediction for two snippets. The first one contains lines three, six, and the second one contains, these are lines of code, uh, lines eight and nine subsequent to the same file. First, the model tries to create a representation for individual lines of code. This representation then compiles the content of line of code, but also a summary of all lines that have been seen so far in file. Then it will try and create a representation for snippet. This representation encompasses content of all lines of code within that snippet, but also a summary of the best that has been seen in the file so far. So at this level, we kind of have a contextual representation of the snippet. Using these, we will have a prediction for snippet as one or zero. So this is uh, the main idea of the model. The performance of this model is like right this last one. And we optimize these rules for high precision. Um, so for set, we get 74% precision with 10% rate. The recall is, of course, quite low, but these predictions will be highly accurate, which is the behavior we would want. Obviously, slow recall points out that there's a lot of scope for future work, improving the recall of these models. Um, so that's all. Thank you. And our code and data is also available for experiments at this point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? All right, I do have one question about this uh, wonderful idea. So can you elaborate more about uh, about the future work? Um, what's possible directions you want to go following this work? Yeah, so, so what is happening is that we are probably getting some of the count locations, but we really miss out on a lot. Um, and we have kind of started to kind of explore uh, some ideas more related to what could be more unusual or surprising constructs in code that might need a comment. Uh, we tried using language model to kind of figure out if something is unusual at some point, or we also tried to use background information. For example, if something is just referring to things in a standard library, then maybe that's not surprising. Um, but we haven't, some of these like preliminary approaches didn't get us very far, but I think that's kind of the main direction we want to go, identifying surprise. And obviously this doesn't need to be done from the side of language alone. Uh, you could kind of use program analysis and static analysis techniques to figure out uh, what are those points in code uh, that should be commented. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the answer. So let's move to the next um, presenters. But uh, unfortunately, they're, they're not able uh, to do the presentation live. So we have to uh, play the pre-recorded video for this, for, this, uh, uh, for this talk. So the talk's title is Retrieval-Based Natural Source Code Summarization. Hello everyone, I'm Jim. Today I'm going to present our paper, Retrieval Based Neural Source Code Summarization. This is the outline. First, as we all know, a code file mainly includes source code and its summaries or comments. Developers write code summaries based on the code. The source code summarization is a technology for generating summaries. Summaries are very useful for understanding and maintaining source code. Developers often spend a lot of time on reading and comprehending programs. However, in real life, well-commented projects are few, which incur more maintenance cost. So it's important to explore automatic techniques. There are two types of existing techniques, IR-based and AMD-based ones. Early studies paid much attention to IR-based methods, including VSM and ISI. Based on them, for example, given the code shown in left, they try to work keywords or search similar code and reuse its summary. Recent work shows that AMT-based methods are promising and out of form IR-based ones. The typical architecture is the uh, encoder decoder, which includes an LCM for encoding code snippets into context vector and another LCM 
for decoding and generating the summary. But there are also limitations in MT models. A recent study on commit message generation found that a very simple retrieve based method can outperform a carefully designed MT model. It points out that MT tends to generate common patterns. Besides, in the MT community, it's also revealed that MT model is comparatively weak in generating infrequent engrams. Further, in our datasets, the statistics shows that nearly 80% summaries contain low frequency words. The next part is our approach to the problem. First, we investigate a Python method case to compare IR and MT. You can see that IR best summaries contain the low frequency word double IS, but MT can generate. Even so, MT best summaries are more flexible and uh, semantically correct. For example, it doesn't generate noises like a remove or virtual directory, as IR does. So why does why not combine them to generate a better summary? The truth is that it's much harder than it sounds. First, we must know when the decoder needs to generate a low frequency word. Second, what should the decoder generate? If a low frequency word is needed, it will simply generate all low frequency words. Then there will be much noise, and thus the quality will be very poor. In this paper, we propose our solution to realize it. The basic idea is to augment MT model with retrieved knowledge according to the similarity and the conditional probability, so that let MT model know if it should generate a low frequency word at each time. This is a detailed framework. It includes an intentional encode decoder model, similar code retrieval, and the retrieval based neural summary generation. I meet the details of MT in this part because it's already introduced before. There is a syntactic level and a semantic level retrieval. We represent the code as easily based to consequence and use Lucerne to efficiently retrieve most of the similar code from the training set. For the semantic level, we reuse the training encoder and max pooling to obtain a single vector for the code. Then we compute the cosine similarity to retrieve another similar code from the training set. This is our true best neural summary generator. It encodes each test code and its most similar ones simultaneously, gets their contest vectors with attention mechanism, where we denote these conditional probabilities by p-test, p sin, and p set. Then we calculate and normalize the similarities to make the two code comparable based on the test added distances with dynamic programming. We also add a lambda as a, as a, a hyperparameter that can be manually tuned based on the final conditional distributions above. We can generate the whole summary sentence word by word. About the evaluation. This is the experiment data in Python and Java. The bottom table is the statistics about the two datasets. It's obvious that there are many low focus words in both of them. I present two key research questions in this part. The first is about the performance of our approach. From the first group in table 1, we can conclude that retrieval best methods yield good results, and this indicates there does exist similar code in the training set. Next is the empty best group. Their performances vary a lot according to the evaluation metrics. And obviously, code NN performs worse because it only depends on the embeddings of tokens to understand the semantics of a code snippets. While other methods incorporating API and AST knowledge, finally, we can see that our approach achieves the best performance in terms of all evaluation metrics. This attributes to the combination of similar contests with an empty model and proves that our approach is superior to the GRMT from ARP community. We study the effectiveness of our approach from two aspects. First, we study the effectiveness of each component in it. By comparison, we can see that the performance improves a lot when adding retrieval knowledge. Next, we perform a statistical analysis 
about the low frequency words in generative summaries. From the table, we can see that our approach can correctly predict more low frequency words than AMT when the word frequency is small, for example, uh, less than 10. Obviously, these additional low frequency words come from the summaries of our retrieved code snippets, which validates the effectiveness of our architecture. We also perform human evaluation and the results confirm the effectiveness of our approach. To conclude, first, AMT based methods are feasible for source code summarization, but they also have natural drawbacks, such as the low frequency word problem emphasized in our paper. So the next conclusion is our retrieve based neural approach is effective for mitigating the problem and thus enhances the performance. However, this does not mean the problem has been completely solved because the overall performance is still not satisfactory. In the future, we re recommend researchers to pay more attention to neural source code simulation to find and solve various bottlenecks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, um, this is the chair. Uh, this is your chair. I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, I have no idea what just happened and it looks like it's, it, it is playing the recording um, of this session. Uh, yeah, so um, Let's move on to the to the last presenter. Uh, and, but I'm so sorry for the for the uh, for the first presenter. Um, and um, so let's uh, let's move on to the last one due to the time limitation. Um, so Casey, so please uh, share your screen. Am I good? Yep. So um, thank you so much. So uh, you can start when you are ready. Okay. Uh, hello, I am Casey Casanova, and today I will present our Near Vision paper, A Theory of Dual Channel Constraints. Models of code based on program analysis and statistical properties have different strengths and weaknesses, including whether learned properties are sound or probabilistic, their ability to scale, and where information is extracted from. Research to combine and exploit these methods is still early on, and so we'd like to present a framework for thinking about code that will be able to take advantage from signals from all sources. We first note that code is written for two audiences, the machine that must execute the code correctly and other programmers who must read, be able to read and maintain it. However, how is code processed by each of the two audiences? For this, we introduce the idea of two channels of code. Code has a formal algorithmic channel, which represents the computable meaning of the code, and it has a natural language channel, which consists of the natural language meanings and cues that help programmers approximate meaning. For example, this function is the sieve of Eratosthenes, and the natural language clues include the names of the variables, the way the code is laid out on the screen, and potentially even small ordering patterns. Any of these can help programmers understand that this is a function that computes primes without having to compute each step mentally, which may be cognitively expensive. Key to relating the dual channels to the two audiences is that these information channels are used asymmetrically. The machine only uses the formal algorithmic channel, while humans use both when writing code are simultaneously trying to make the code correct and easy to process. Our near paper calls for exploiting channel inter interactions as previous research has tended to leave information off the table. Each channel constrains the other with algorithmic constraints on the natural language channel giving a way to explore how people and language models process code and with natural language constraints on the algorithmic channel providing a way to bridge the machine's knowledge gap arising from asymmetry. For an example of using algorithmic constraints to learn about the natural language channel, consider equivalent expressions, which retain meaning on the algorithmic channel but have different natural language implementations. These can provide a controlled opportunity to understand how people process code and validate language model metrics used in training. 
All their things equal, when a language model finds something less surprising, how do people relate to it? We found that people tend to prefer and comprehend code that language models find less surprising faster. This helps validate language models and provides a new task to compare the quality of language models and understand how programmers model predictable code. In the other direction, bridging the asymmetrical split of information can augment program analysis. For example, this tool Refinim from some of my co-authors refines, refines types with natural language information. Built-in types can be imprecise, but variable names can hint at more precise conceptual types. These can be used to refine the existing types, which enables the type system to error check more effectively. In this case, possibly presenting password data from leaking to other, another variable by a programmer mistake. We can also consider that when the information can change in each channel is different, it might indicate malicious or even defective code. Some earlier work from other authors have made use of this idea. From Asdroid, which found malicious Android apps by contrasting which text was presented to users with what apps actually did, to the code comment consistency work by Lin Tan et al, finding still comments that conflicted with the written code that might need to be updated. As we, we would like to push for a refocus on these kinds of analyses using more modern language modeling techniques and generalizing to use all the information in each channel of source code. In conclusion, we hope this framework acknowledging the asymmetrical nature of the channels and how they interact and constrain each other will drive forward research making a more holistic approach to code. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions from the, uh, from the audience with this uh, near paper? Then I do have a question about uh, about your last slide. Uh, so you talk about the uh, the faulty code and the malicious code of that direction. So can you can you talk a little bit more on that? Yeah. So the idea is that when you communicate to each of these audiences, your in one sense your code is broadcasting signals to the people who read it. On the other hand, what the machine is actually doing it is something else. So if the code is telling the humans reading it that it's doing one thing, but is actually executing another, um, that could be a sign that oh, you've used poor variable names or you have poor comments. In fact, I think one of the earlier papers in this uh, session kind of moved in that direction, which is the kind of thing we'd like to see. But you can also have it be malicious where someone deliberately is trying to write code that might be doing something bad or telling users that is doing one thing while it's doing another. And I think by looking at these kinds of conflicts in the code, you will be able to identify cases where either the code needs to be updated or someone's trying to behave like a bad actor. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that will be all for this session. And thank you, uh, a big thank you to all of the presenters. And again, I, um, I have to say sorry to the fifth presenter there was some difficulties in the in the video playing, um, but we are the, but we are going to share uh, the link of the video so everybody can uh, can can watch it. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending this this session. Um, have a good day. Thank you. education training and um, we will start in a few minutes so stay tuned and get ready and then we'll wait um, a couple more minutes because more people might join from other sessions and the official start will be um, five minutes after 4 p.m in UTC
Welcome everyone to the first session for the software engineering and education training track of ICSI. And um, we wanna kick off the session today with a really interesting um, part of papers and authors and presenters. We basically have the two distinguished papers in this session. So we already get the best papers presented today, but there will be more sessions in the upcoming days. First of all, I wanna thank you, all the reviewers, all the people who have been involved, especially the organizers of the software engineering and education track. Um, I think this is really an important track that we should have at ICSI and that we also want to have in the future. And um, we will start the session now. Um, before we do that, if you have any questions, please ask them on Clouder. That's basically on the ICSI webpage. And there is a little panel on the left side at the bottom. And there you can ask the questions. And then we will take the uh, most interesting questions and ask them uh, to the um, presenters at the end of their talk. Um, now let's let kick off the session with our first paper. Daniel will um, present something and evaluate uh, or evaluated something about the impact of experiential learning in computing accessibility education. He's from the Rochester Institute of, of Technology. And this is one of the distinguished papers. Daniel, please get ready and start as soon as everything works. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So welcome everybody. Um, so this paper is I'm presenting and evaluating the impact of experiential learning in computing accessibility education. Um, so this was conducted at the Rochester Institute, Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. And this work was done um, with support of the US National Science Foundation and my co-authors are Wei Shi Shi, Yasmin El Galeli, Sam Malakowski, Chi Yu, and myself is Dan Krutz. So I'll start things off with a couple um, piece of information. So approximately 15% of the world's population has a disability. So this could be a hearing disability, a vision disability, a cognitive disability, or any um, other wide variety of um, disabilities that can impact somebody's computing experience. And unfortunately, much of the software being created today is not accessible. Developers aren't motivated to create accessible software and many developers problematically don't know how to create accessible software. So the overall goal for this project is to create easily adoptable educational accessibility material. Um, and the, this material is designed to present or is to provide foundational concepts in creating accessible software and demonstrate the importance of accessible software. And when I say easily adoptable, that is one of the main focuses of this project because we know everybody is pressed for time in their courses. It's very hard to find time inside of a CS1 or CS2 class for new material. And especially now with everything going on, instructors don't always have um, I guess you'd say the most motivation to include new and different material in their courses. And so, like I said, a primary objective behind this work is to make material that is as easily accessible, as easily includable as possible in a computing course. And as I'll mention a couple of times, um, all the material is available on, the, on our project website at all.rit.edu. So a couple of things I'll talk about today are the accessible learning labs that we've created, some of the goals of the labs, the design for the study that we conducted using our created material, our results and a conclusion. So the accessible learning labs, they are self encapsulated experiential educational accessibility material. And they require only a browser and internet connection for usage. So if you are an instructor and you wanna include these in your class or you are an individual learner, all you need to do is go to our project website and you can interact with all of our material right, material right through the web page. So as long as you have a browser and an internet connection, you're good to go. So some of the labs that we've created so far are uh, focused on the accessibility topics of hearing, vision, colorblindness, dexterity challenges, and cognitive challenges. I will say if you go to the website, um, anytime the next week or so, we are in the midst of redoing a couple of the labs. So you may see some work in progress or construction symbols. Um, but the idea is, is that at least by the end of the summer, all five of these labs will be back up and running for everybody. So some of the primary components 
inside of these labs are background uh, background instructional material to provide foundational um, um, content for the user on the accessibility challenge, um, an experiential hands-on activity that the user can um, work with, an empathy creating mat material or component, and a concluding quiz. And one of the things that's really cool about these labs is the empathy creating material. Whereas you might go through it and do this activity, and then there'll be a feature that's built into the activity that will make the page look like it would to someone who's colorblind. So if the page um, or software is created in an inaccessible manner, it's likely to be very frustrating or even impossible for you to use the software using that empathy creating feature that um, um, disability emulation component. So where these labs can be used, they can be used in a variety of computing courses, such as general programming, CS1, CS2 courses, um, obviously accessibility courses, but they can also be used in non-computing courses, such as project management classes. And even in, we've used these in outreach events and camps. So we found um, from, from an observational perspective that the, these materials, a lot of times will get folks interested in to computing. Maybe they weren't thinking about accessibility as a computing topic. And so we've actually found that a lot of younger folks um, have been really interested in accessibility after using our material. So again, you can um, use all of our material at all.rit.edu. And like I said, there's nothing to install. So a couple of the research questions we addressed with our labs are how effective are the labs in motivating students about the importance of accessibility? How effective are the labs in informing students about foundational accessibility principles? And how impactful are empathy creating materials in accessibility education? So this study was conducted using 276 students and um, 10 of our CS2 sections. And group A was our control group. They used existing materials. Group B used our material without empathy creating content. And group C used our material with empathy creating content. And so the studied um, design we used was a pre-lab survey. Um, students went through and they conducted the activity. Um, group C used, it, used the interac interactive empathy creating material and they con concluded with a quiz and a post-lab survey. So the first research question, how effective are the labs in motivating students about the importance of accessibility? And we found that a statistical, statistical analysis demonstrated a positive impact that our labs had in motivating students about the importance of computing accessibility education. And we felt like this is very important because really the first step to getting folks to create accessible software is to make them motivated about creating accessible software to show the need to create accessible software. Next, our next research question was how effective are the labs in informing students about foundational accessibility principles? And again, a statistical analysis demonstrated that our material using our experiential format was more effective in informing students about foundational accessibility principles. So these labs are not designed to teach a participant about every single concept out there about accessibility, but as long as they walk away understanding some foundational principles, we felt like that was very good. And finally, how impactful are empathy creating materials in accessibility education? And a t-test demonstrated that empathy creating materials were a very important of accessibility education. And um, these observations about empathy creating material being important were backed up by our findings from RQ1 and RQ2. So I think I'm about out of time. And so I think I'll wrap things up there. And again, I'll acknowledge this is supported by the US National Science Foundation. And if anybody has any questions about use, utilizing our material, or wants to include it in, our cor in their courses um, over the summer or next fall, because obviously there'll be a little, bit of, a little bit of online learning taking place. We're very happy to work with you and you are looking for folks to partner up with to include these in their computing and non-computing -curricu curriculum. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, a very good presentation. And now we have um, a couple of minutes for questions. I don't see any questions on Clouder. Yet, so let me try to ask something. Um, you said the material is online and other instructors can use it. How difficult is it to adopt the material? Do we need to install tools, or is it just um, slides that we use? No. Uh, yeah. So, so the material ranging from 
the background um, material, um, like in background instructional content that's provided via lecture slides. So if you want to use those as a lecture, you can. We also provide videos um, hosted on YouTube. And so you can just show those videos with us lecturing to your students. Um, but there is absolutely nothing for you to install. So as long as you have a reasonably new web browser and an internet connection, you should be totally fine. And it can be as simple as you literally telling your students, go to this link, follow the instructions. And when you're done, submit a screenshot of your quiz. And it can be as simple as that. Sounds great. And uh, what kind of skills do the students need? Is it on a bachelor level or more on a master level? Um, so, so definitely um, more on the bachelor level. Frankly, you could give these to a student who had never done any programming before, and they should be able to at least get through some of the more foundational activities. So these are designed so they could be used in, even, even in a high school. Great. So we have the first question on Clouder. Um, is there any programming projects in the lab that is programming language specific? Um, so I believe, um, so I'll say no, um, but we do, um, so we have a simulated IDE inside of the activities. So it's kind of looks like almost like a sub fake sublime page where the participant can go through and interact with the software. And I believe um, some are Python based. But with that said, if you have never done Python before, the foundational activities are simple enough. So they would be very easy to um, um, alter. So for example, one of the foundational labs is literally adding in proper alt tags into an image. So it doesn't matter if you've never even done HTML before based on the instructions that we provide, um, any reasonable user should be able to go through and, and utilize those labs. Okay, sounds good. Um, I don't see any more questions, so we can get ready for the next um, uh, presentation. So Ishtiak, please um, get ready. And thanks again, Daniel, for the great presentation and answering all the questions. Um, the next presentation will be um, given by Ishtiak. He is from the Pennsylvania um, State University, and he will talk about an empirical study of teaching qualities of popular computer science and software engineering instructors using ratemyprofessor.com data. So this now gets really interesting. Ishtiak, um, as soon as you're ready, please start. Can you guys see my screen and hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, so. Um, so hi everyone, uh, this is Ishtiak Hussein. Uh, this work is uh, done by Eliaxi Kavalchuk, Alec Goldenberg and myself. Uh, we are from Pennsylvania State University at Abington, and as you can see, our work, our project is titled An Empirical Study of Teaching Qualities. Ah, I'm not going to read the whole uh, title to you anyway. So let's get into the details. So let me ask you this. Um, what are the most common characteristics of the popular instructors that you had in your student life? If you ask me that question, uh, these are the two people that comes to my mind. On the left is Miss Rashida Zaman. She was my high school Bengali teacher, Bengali literature teacher. And on the right, more recently, uh, Dr. Professor Gautam Das uh, from University of Texas at Arlington. He taught algorithms course to us. Now, both of them have a striking similarity in their way of teaching the course, engaging the students. And I was fascinated to ask the question, like what are the common characteristics of popular computer science instructors out there. And here is the data and result that we got. Now I'm going to talk about the definition of popularity, our data source, everything in a uh, following slide. But just for a second, let's focus on this slide and take a look. So you can see on the y-axis, we have tags that students provided for their popular professors. And in the x-axis, you see the tag count, their frequency. Now, if we pay even more close attention to the graph, you'll see, apart from being their lectures amazing, the next couple of items are all soft skills, okay? Students think their professors or, or tag their popular professors as respected, caring, inspirational, giving good feedback, their class being fun. They don't mind giving a lot of homework from their professors 
but they also mentioned that they were accessible outside the class. And you might also notice that if you skip the class, probably you won't pass the, those professor's courses and they have clear grading criteria. Now, since we are all software engineering professors, we care about software engineers, right? Uh, and I asked the same question for software engineering professors. And here's what we found. Now the orange line here is software engineering popular professors and blue line as before are computer science professors. Now, if you again pay, pay a close attention to the graph, you'd see that popular software engineering professors are not that bad. They, they quite well go along with the popular computer science professors. However, there are some areas where software engineering professors can improve. For example, our class is a little bit boring. Huh? Hilarious wise, fun wise, we, we need to do more work here. Also, clear grading criteria is something that we really need to improve on. Uh, but on the flip side, we are good at giving good feedback. Our courses are project-based, group project-based, and which is understandable because software engineering courses are mainly or usually more uh, team-based, collaborative, project-based courses anyways. And also we um, might be also I mean, giving too many quizzes to the students. So having these in mind, uh, I was asking myself and, and, the, and the data source there that is there any concrete examples that we can learn from the popular computer science professors uh, like how and why students think they are so popular. And we mined more than 9,000 students' feedbacks uh, about their popular computer science professors and came up with these points. Now, the first, the number one is not uh, like surprising is that they are humane, humble, kind, life influencers. And as an example, students mentioned that these professors not only just lecture in the class, but they share their life lessons. They motivate, they even help students choose their future career paths. Now, the next two points that came up, and I want to emphasize here that this study was done before this pandemic, and students mentioned that those students, those popular, stud uh, popular professors use YouTube websites to put up their resources online, and they're accessible through different means, like through Skype, Zoom, and wiki pages like Piazza. Now, Nowadays, we are all using these tools, but remember, these professors were using these tools before the pandemic uh, themselves. And they also help them uh, prepare for internships with tips and tricks. But most importantly, the last but not the least is they listen to the students' feedback. These professors listen to the students' feedback and they are open to changes like class space, syllabus, or even they're flexible with their deadlines. Now, what about the software engineering professors? Are we all bad? The answer is no, there's some good news for us. Overall, the students out there, they attribute or their software engineering professors, not only popular, overall, 38% of the professors are awesome, 13% of them are good, but there are also striking 29% professors, software engineering professors that are uh, attributed as awful and we, it's, close to one third. So we need to do a better job and we have a uh, scope for improvement. Now let's go into the technical detail. Like what's the popularity mean? What is our data source? So first let me talk about the data source. We use ratemyprofessor.com data website. For those who, who do not know what ratemyprofessor.com is, it's a website publicly available to the North American and United Kingdom students. And by North America, I mean Canada and US where students can go freely, they can rate their professors, leave their feedback and so forth. And for popularity, what we did is we chose those professors, computer science professors or software engineering professors who have at least 10 students feedback and also an average of 3.5 or more out of five rating score. And we only chose the good uh, student comments. Remember, we are trying to figure out the guideline of the popular computer science professors and learn from them. So we just chose the good comments from the students. Now, as I said, we did this study for computer science and software engineering professors from the top 20 universities from US and Canada. 
and uh, that was ranked by usnews.com website for 2018. And the workflow went like this. We developed a Python-based web crawler using Selenium web driver that goes to the uh, RMP or Rate My Professor website, uh, searches for a university, selects or filters out the department, computer science, and then selects the or filters out the only the top good professors. And then it opens the individual professors into a separate window and that, that then downloads all the comments in a JSON file format. Now let's talk about why this is important. Now the big picture is just in the US, there is, it is projected by the US uh, Department of Labor, Bureau of Statistics, Labor Statistics, that there is a projected growth of employment opportunity just for the software engineering students uh, that will rise from 21 to 26 person in by year 2028. So retaining, recruiting, and uh, graduating software engineering students is becoming very important nowadays, just in the areas and alike across the world. And personally, it is important because if a class is interesting, engaging, that implies to greater student satisfaction and success. And for North American professors, at least, they reflect on your uh, teaching evaluations, right? And if we can teach a good course, our promotion, tenureship, et cetera, depends on these factors. And why ratemyprofessor.com? Now, ratemyprofessor.com is an open uh, website for, to public, and it has tremendous amount of data. 19 million student feedbacks for over 1.7 million faculties, over 7,500 universities across US, Canada, and UK. Now, threats to validity. We agree that it's an open website. Anyone, any student can go there and without even taking a course can leave a comment, either positive or negative. And it only, the ratemyprofessor.com only takes US, Canada, and UK. So it's the rest of the world is out there. There must, there, I mean, there are tremendous good professors out there that we cannot simply consider into our data set. And uh, we only took top 20, but we could have maybe we will, we will do in the future study, add more universities into our data set. And I encourage you everyone to read this paper and all our data and uh, the web color will be available in our website. And finally, I leave you with my contact information. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer and discuss more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Istiak. Great presentation. We already have the first question. We have um, time for one or two questions. And the first one is, are there any other websites you would consider to get data from? Yes, there are, like rate my professor, there are ratemyteachers.com, uluf, I don't know if it's called uluf.com, whofirst.com, but the reason we chose ratemyprofessor.com is because it's been used in previous research studies. Uh, and there are 4 million user visits per month as reported by RNP or ratemyprofessor.com data. So that's why we chose it, but yes, there are other web sources, similar websites available out there. And there's another question, and I basically had the same one, so I'm interested in your answer. Are you concerned about students rating up professors because their classes are easy and not because the class necessarily taught them a lot? So that's a very good question. And I mean, we thought that that might be the case. If it's an easy, uh, they will rate a professor good. But there are previous studies that shows, no, that's not the case. Students actually who go there and talk about greatly about the professor, they are really actually good professors out there who encourage them, motivate them. And uh, yeah, I mean, dissatisfied students like customers these days will go and rate a professor badly, but please remember that we only took the good comments. So that uh, take care of the question you just asked. Okay, um, I think there are a couple of more questions. Um, you might wanna uh, look at it and answer them on Clouder as well, but because of time reasons, we have to continue with the next talk. Thank you. And um, this will, yeah, thank you again for the presentation and answering the questions. And um, the next talk will be by Aubrey from Clemson's University, and she will talk about sidekicks and superheroes. So as soon as you're ready, Aubrey, um, please get started and share your screen. All right, how's that? Can everyone see me? Or at least see my presentation? <laughs> Good. Great, thanks. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey Lawson. I'm with um, Clemson University, and I'm presenting my work I did with my advisor, Eileen Kramer, Sidekicks and Superheroes, a look into student reasoning about concurrency with threads versus actors. Concurrency is a proven difficult topic in computing education. As more modern systems have utilized concurrency, its concepts have become required or recommended in undergraduate curricula standards. Prior to learning concurrency, computing students are typically educated within a sequential framework. As a result, students may struggle to adapt their mental model of computing to fit concurrency concepts, and instructors are tasked with finding the best pedagogical tools to help students overcome these difficulties. Expected learning outcomes for concurrency involve understanding new terminologies, such as data races, which involve scenarios they haven't encountered before. They are also expected to reason about what issues may arise from these scenarios and know how to solve them in multiple paradigms. I wanna briefly define what I mean by concurrency here. A concurrent program is one that has multiple computations happening at the same time, simultaneously or in an interleaved manner. This may result in additional complexity when multiple processes attempt to read and modify the same data. Now let's look at this from a computing student's perspective. You may be familiar with the peanut butter and jelly metaphor from the CS Unplugged activity set. This activity demonstrates how a task is decomposed into instructions that can be sequenced together into a step-by-step -step program to produce a PB&J sandwich. Students with experience in sequential programming, learning at concurrency may feel like they know how to make a PB&J, but are suddenly thrust into managing a fully staffed fresh not kitchen on the busiest night of the year. So how do we as instructors help students? With pedagogical content knowledge, or PCK. PCK is not just knowing the content of the course, but understanding how best to teach its concepts, including ordering of topics, powerful analogies and examples, and understanding of what makes the learning of specific topics easy or difficult. Coming from a constructivist perspective, we do not believe students come into a class as a blank slate. They arrive with their preconceptions and misconceptions in tow, and these have a powerful impact on their engagement with course topics. Knowledge of how students engage with particular topics can help us develop a targeted PCK that address misconceptions and facilitate learning. We have two research questions. The first was, what are common and problematic features in student approaches to solving concurrency-related problems, and how are they represented across the levels of an undergraduate computing program? My prior work was based on my first on this first RQ, and we wanted to explore student engagement with concurrency concepts across all levels of an undergraduate computing program. To achieve this, we administered a natural language prompt to students to discuss the possible problems present in the concert tickets booking system and how to solve them. There was no programming involved to allow students of all levels to reason about the prompt, albeit abstractly. Student responses, 15 from each of four levels, related to the requirements analysis and design phases of the software development process. We derived an emergent feature set representing student design approaches to a concurrency problem. We identified a number of features, but we highlight two here, timing speed and additional complexity. But then we are left uh, wondering about the rest of the software development process. So our second research question is, how are these features represented across the phases of the software development process from requirements analysis through quality assurance? For this work, we focused on both research questions and sought to collect student responses representing later phases in the software development process. We studied students in a special topics course in concurrency in the spring 2019 semester, which contained two programming projects used in the study. There were 24 students in the class and they had the option to work on the projects alone or in pairs. Both projects implemented the party matching problem. The first project used the threads paradigm in Java and required UML diagramming and pseudocode. The second project used the actor's paradigm in Scala with Akka. Both projects included questions for students to respond to and reflect on their process. So this work provides insight into student reasoning about concurrency and specification and implementation phases of the software development process. So let's take a look at this party matching problem. It involves attendees arriving to a party and attempting to pair with someone and leave with them. Our version has a superhero spin. For example, let's say a sidekick is at a party and decide they want to find a partner and leave. They must wait for an appropriate partner, a superhero, to arrive. An arriving superhero can notify everyone of their attendance, and available partners may immediately pair and go fight crime. Now for the threads paradigm, the monitor pattern as applied to the party matching problem looks like this. The active object generates attendees and the data object manages the party. When they arrive, Attendees can update the appropriate condition, whether they're a superhero or a sidekick, which is incrementing the count of that role, and notifying all. Then they immediately try to pair and leave. Once the condition is met, which is a partner is available, they update their condition again, which is decrementing the count of their role. This counts as having left the party. 
The reactor pattern can similarly be used for the actor's paradigm and Scala with Akka. With this message passing paradigm, the active object generates attendees and sends messages to update the condition and try to pair. If they are unable to pair, the data object sends back a fail message rather than waiting, and the active object keeps trying to pair by sending exit messages again. Now, these are just messages intended to exit. This isn't like ending the program kind of exit. Once attendees pair, the conditions are updated and they send a succeed message. We performed a mixed qualitative analysis. Since we sought to explore student reasoning in the new domain of specification and implementation, we, as multiple raters, open coded for emergent features in student programs. Our second qualitative analysis was informed by our feature set derived from the natural language design study. In this context, multiple raters close coded the program to see how design features were represented in student implementations. Let's look at the closed coding first. The timing speed feature represents misconceptions about computing speed and the rate of execution. In the design study, students stated that fast enough computers would avoid data races. In contrast, in this implementation study, students often attempted to slow processes down with arbitrary wait times. They appeared to use scheduling and wait calls alongside synchronization logic, such as with a wait, to impose a global rate of execution. The assumption of a global rate of execution has been discussed in prior work, and our findings also indicate the presence of this misconception. The additional complexity feature is realized in student implementations with multiple extraneous conditions, locks and booleans. There, this was more prevalent in threads than in actor solutions. Each addition can make the already complex task of tracing and debugging concurrent programs even more complicated and overwhelming. In the process of open coding student programs, we found two key features. One is the asymmetry present in synchronization and conditional logic. Some students would implement a wait call without including a signal or notify call in the class. One submission placed in a wait call right after an explicit lock, making it look redundant. And the synchronization logic was all clustered within a single function, arrive, rather than distributed across the methods of the shared data class. At a slightly higher level of abstraction, students also deviated from the design patterns demonstrated in class by not separating the program logic between the shared data object and the active object. This example shows synchronization logic used within the active object class, which should not be responsible for the access control of the shared data. The reflections that students provided were very insightful. When required to provide UML diagramming and pseudocode, almost half of students stated these components were the most challenging aspect of the project. Further, students stated that they did not complete these modeling activities prior to coding, but rather they often completed them after the finished coding and retrofit the models to the implementation. Lastly, we found that students were welcoming of learning new paradigms and frameworks in which to learn concurrency. And a helical approach in which this same program is implemented within different paradigms may help students reinforce concurrency concepts and attain and establish learning outcomes. In regards to threads versus actors, students were very receptive to the actors paradigm and there was less introduction of additional complexity. The projects were sequenced such that the threads paradigm was first introduced the party matching problem and the same problem was used again with the new actors paradigm. Between the two projects, performance didn't vary much. As far as implications for pedagogical content knowledge, we found students didn't diligently, diligently apply the design patterns presented in class. They intermingled the shared data logic and active object logic. And further, they often clustered synchronization calls within a single function. An instructor may choose to present solutions in class that represent the good, the bad, and the ugly to demonstrate the structure of correct and efficient solutions. An instructor might also consider peer assessment using the similar criteria such as design patterns to form a rubric. Additional complexity was a feature persistent in design and implementation phases. To further address the additional complexity students introduce, program simplicity could be added to the rubric. And finally, students' lack of motivation to perform modeling tasks is very interesting to me. They are particularly resistant to conforming to the syntax rules of UML. My future work is based on this question of what do students' software development processes really look like and what kind of informal modeling do they perform? Learning more about how students model when unprompted may help instructors understand how receptive students actually are to modeling activities and what kind of work should be performed to incentivize them to model. Thank you very much, Aubrey. Great presentation. We have um, two minutes for questions, and there's already one in Crowell. Um, thanks for your talk. What was your rationale for making students create UML models instead of directly writing the code? 
So the intention with UML was to try to um, encourage students to model before they jump into the code, um, because these are very complex problems with concurrency to get students to kind of take a minute, take a step back to abstractly think about the problem prompts. And we found that they were particularly resistant to that, but we tried. Okay, I have another question. So I really like your statement in the end that modeling might tend to be too formal and you want to study how informal modeling can help here. Do you have already some insights on this? We have a similar experience in our university and uh, how can this be directed to concurrency problems? So, um, yeah, we had tried to use the design patterns to also allow students to kind of think about ab abstractly about the problems and see if that they if they use those design patterns when they're implementing. Um, the thing is with the collection I'm discussing today, we just got their final solutions. So the work I'm currently working on um, is a data, a huge data collection of student processes in which we were able to capture students working on concurrent problems and um, capture everything that they were kind of saying along the way and how they were coding about it. So I'm hoping out of that, I'll have more insight into any sort of that informal modeling and whether students are discussing or kind of writing down and drawing and, and speculating about the problem as they make sense of it. Um, but that's currently a work in progress. So I don't have any outcomes for that just yet. Okay, there's one more question in Clouder. Um, did you find any difference in students who modeled versus those who did not model? Um, we did not find a, um, a very much of a difference between the students. Um, we had, we didn't have, I mean, this was a small sample um, relatively, so we weren't looking for statistical significance. I'm not sure that was part of the question, but um, the performance didn't vary strongly from with students who stated that they, they preferred not to model or didn't. But this is within the context of UML, which is why I'm very interested in the other ways that students model. Okay, thank you very much. There are more questions, but um, we are running out of time and we need to go to the next presentation. Thank you. Um, if there are more questions, um, always feel free to post them on Clouder or on the paper chat, and then the authors can also address them afterwards. The next presentation is the second distinguished paper of the education track and will be presented by Kevin from uh, the Lero, the Irish Software Research, um, about um, we should teach our students what industry doesn't want. Kevin, please get started and start Hi. as you're ready. Well, I want to tell you that we should teach our students what industry doesn't want. And this paper came from uh, attending so many sessions at ICSI where we were told all the time about what industry wanted and how important it was that we provided it. So I'm, my argument is that our primary duty as professional educators is not to industry and it's not to government and it's not to the people who employ us, but it's to our students. And in that case, we must teach them more than just knowledge and skills to make them employable, but we must teach them what they'll need in order to have long, satisfying, productive and worthwhile careers. So that's the reason why I feel we have to teach them many more things and of which I've chosen four uh, for reasons of space. The first one is we need to teach them professional ethics. Maybe I don't need to argue for this, but at the moment we've had so many awful examples of software enabled actions that were immoral or unethical or illegal, or even all three, that I think it's necessary to point out that responsible software engineers could and should have stopped, have shouted stop in the middle of these projects. Now I'm not going to go into examples, but you probably don't need to be reminded of what's happened in Boeing. And here's one I came across just the other day, uh, where a United Nations report X, uh, says that the uh, free basics version of, of uh, Facebook was had a determining, that's my word, that's my emphasis, but that's their word, a determining role in starting up hatred in um, Myanmar. These are really serious allegations. So how are we going to teach our students professional ethics? Well, years and years ago, 1980 to be precise, I wrote an, an introductory ethics quiz for my students. And I'm going to just show you one example of what's filled in with them. Um, I found over the years that the students have a very poor grasp of ethical reasoning, but they're very willing to learn. 
So just uh, you can find all this in the paper now. So they, and there's a link in the paper to where I've put uh, on Google Docs. I've put the actual documentation. But here you can see the the date of this. Uh, oh, it doesn't show the date. Okay, it's around 1988. But we uh, I put in. Uh, let's look at question number three. Are you willing to program a microcomputer on a nuclear missile that's going to target Iraq? And uh, the students were entitled to say no. Absolutely not, yes, I'm happy to, or I'd resign and I'd take another job, or I'd even launch a protest movement. And the students, as you can see, had a huge distribution of answers. And they even answered yes uh, uh, to many things that were illegal, and they were launched protests about things that are quite legal, and in some cases might even be ethical. Secondly, we need to teach our students how to blow the whistle when and how, and just particularly we need to tell them to consider the alternatives because it's a very, very drastic step to take and it involves costs no matter how well motivated you are. But there are times and places where pulling the plug is the only right thing to do for a responsible software engineer. Thirdly, we need to teach them career management. Uh, there was a little about that earlier. Why we, the students need to know how and when to move job. They need to know how to negotiate better conditions if they're being underpaid or badly treated. They need to know the importance of lifelong learning. They need to know why they should be in a professional body. And there are lots more. And these are not things that uh, every employer would want them to know and some, some employers would like them not to know. But they are our responsibility to teach them to our students so that they have a good career. And then to make them per full persons, we need to help them grow and become responsible adults with their own values. We can only help them in this, but at least we can help them be, for example, value aware so that they interrogate the values and assumptions that are often explicit in the systems that they're asked to build. So the takeaway message is that the world needs responsible, reflective software engineers, and we can help produce that. We shouldn't wait for industry to ask for it. And if you can, would you read the paper? Uh, you can take uh, copies of my quiz or you can make up one of your own and I'd be really interested in hearing how you get on. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I think this is a great message. Um, we should really value these things that you found and that you present here. Um, we have time for one question. Um, um, there's already one here. Great talk. Are CS profs the ones who should do all this or is one of the issues that students are not taking enough courses outside of our departments? What do you think? Well, I think it comes better if it's taught by CS professors. I know people do bring in ethicists and bring in lectures on moral, the moral philosophy and so on. My own experience is that the students are inclined to treat guest lecturers as just that, whereas if you bring in, if, you, if it comes in as part of the mainstream, then it works with them. Okay, there's uh, one more question. Um, were you taught any of these things at university when you have been a student? If so, which one in particular has stuck with you through um, your whole life? Uh, no, not while I was an undergraduate. I was a little bit older than an undergraduate when I first came across David Parnas, and I definitely learned a good bit from him. And can you um, please suggest any study material? I, I, study material? There are a few references in the paper, and uh, on uh, Google Docs I put up the the question the questionnaires that i've used and the results that i got okay thank you very much again great presentation thank and you. now we're heading to the last presentation last but not least candy peng from the mcian uh, university will present her paper understanding devops education with grounded theory candy please go ahead you're going to play the video Hello everyone, my name is Candy Peng. I am presenting to you the paper Understanding DevOps Education with Grant Theory. In academia, many people don't know much about DevOps. Let's start with introducing DevOps. DevOps stands for Development Operations. It is a topic raised from industry. 
DevOps is one of the hottest technical terms searched in Google search, as shown in this chart. To understand the popularity of DevOps in industry, we search for DevOps job postings. There were a significant number of postings for DevOps practitioners. Hence, DevOps is an important skill needed by IT practitioners. According to ACM and IEEE, computer science undergraduate program should prepare students for the workforce. Since DevOps is an important skill required by the IT industry, institutions should teach computer science students DevOps before they enter the workforce. But what is DevOps? DevOps is not only about technology. In short, DevOps is cultural, procedural, and technical movement to advance customer satisfaction, business, and innovation. DevOps was evolved from continuous integration, CI. CI was described in the book Continuous Integration, written in 2007. Later, in 2010, the CI concept was extended to continuous delivery, CD. From CD, the automated cycle was expanded from development to operations and become DevOps as shown in this model. Therefore, DevOps covers all process from development to operations. Since DevOps cover all things about development and operations, it is very complicated. Cyber Labs tried to identify all DevOps related tools and organize them into these periodic tables here. The tools are categorized into 15 categories according to the functionalities. There is no single tool that can be called DevOps tool. When DevOps is so complicated, what are the requirements for a DevOps practitioner? Lee have studied DevOps practitioner's job postings in LinkedIn and summarized these eight DevOps job requirements. DevOps practitioners need to have operations, development, technology, infrastructure, procedure, and interpersonal skills. Who are the people having all these skills? They are called jack of all trades. It is very difficult for institutions to train jack of all trades. When DevOps is very popular in industry, it is not popular in academia. I searched for DevOps related publication in IEEE Explorer, ACM Digital Library, and Google Scholar. The number of publications related to DevOps were shown on the left side in each chart. Then I compared numbers of publications in other popular topics such as container, cloud, and deep learning. The numbers of publications in other popular topics are shown on the right side in each chart. Beware that the y-axis are logarithmically scaled. Hence, publication on other popular topics are significantly higher than those about DevOps. When academics were not familiar with DevOps, how can academics train students to be DevOps practitioner? Therefore, this is what we try to study. To fulfill the great demands of DevOps practitioners now and in the future, we want to find out how institutions can teach the student about DevOps. We use the ground theory instead of a traditional quantitative methodology in our research. Ground theory is a social science qualitative research methodology. Since DevOps is a cultural, procedural, and technical movement, the use of quantitative methodology may fail to consider the social aspect of DevOps. Therefore, we select to use ground theory. Using ground theory, I study DevOps education from the academic perspective and the industry perspective, and I have six findings. Starting with their academic findings, I reviewed the computer science curriculum of the top 50 institutions in the world and find that DevOps topics were barely included in computer science curriculum, except software testing. It is possible that the academics were actually teaching DevOps, but the DevOps content were not reflected in the curriculum. Therefore, I tried to survey the academics and talk to them about DevOps teaching. After a month-long effort, I got only four responses for my survey, and the academics told me that they were not interested in DevOps at all. It is not likely that they would teach students about DevOps. 
If academics learn that DevOps can enhance the research project, they may pay more attention to DevOps. Therefore, I interview graduate students to see whether they will adopt DevOps in their research project. Unfortunately, the grad students clearly indicate that they would not adopt DevOps. First, they believe DevOps adoption is really difficult. Secondly, they didn't believe adopting DevOps will increase the chance of publication. Then, from the industry perspective, I find that industry is not sure what they want from the DevOps practitioner. I studied DevOps job posting at different job sites. For sure, DevOps practitioner were highly demanded, but the requirements were completely different from company to company. When the industry does not know what they demand, it is hard for institution to supply. Then, I try to identify the roles and responsibility of DevOps practitioner in industry. I found a large number of DevOps blogs, research reports, rights papers, conference, communities, and organizations. However, all of them were still trying to define DevOps. Some organizations were trying to define curriculum and certificates for DevOps, but those curriculum are changing significantly from version to version. There is no broadly recognized or de facto curriculum yet. Since there is no defined curriculum, I talked to DevOps experts to find out how they become DevOps experts. They all indicate that education is the least important factor in DevOps education. They have become DevOps experts through on-the-job, hands-on experience. DevOps practitioner needs diversified experience with both breadth and depth. Concluding our findings, DevOps is becoming a standard in industry, and DevOps practitioners are in high demand. We employed the ground theory methodology to study the challenge in DevOps education through interview, survey, data collection, and analysis. We find that DevOps is lacking of commonly recognized scope, curriculum, and credential. Roles and responsibility of DevOps practitioner are still rapidly changing. Therefore, institutions cannot provide comprehensive DevOps education. To foster DevOps education, we propose 11 hypotheses in five groups. This hypothesis will set the ground about DevOps teaching. For example, the first hypothesis suggests that when using DevOps, students will get better grades in their assignments. These are the 11 hypotheses we proposed. In addition to the five groups of DevOps education hypothesis, there were also other research opportunities in DevOps. However, lacking DevOps definition and scope make DevOps research difficult. Therefore, one important future task is to identify DevOps skill sets and tools in industry. Then, institutions can focus research and teaching on those skill sets and tools. These are some of the references. The complete details about the project can be found in my PhD dissertation. If you are interested in DevOps education, please contact me, Candy Peng. My email address is candy.peng at mckeven.ca. Thank you for your time and all the best. Thank you very much, Candy. Um, great presentation, great video. I um, agree that DevOps is a very important topic and that we also should teach it in the university. And um, we have to think about whether we can teach this in classes or more in practical courses. Um, there are already some questions. Um, the first one was um, stated early. Please, I would like some clarification on hypothesis six. What does it exactly mean that students get higher grades if they um, apply artificial intelligence? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, basically, if I remember correctly, the hypothesis six said that our, if we employ AI in the DevOps like our flow, will that improve students' uh, performance in assignment? Basically, that means if we adopt AI analysis when are they doing coding. So one important point about DevOps is that when they don't, student will not just submit their final program. Throughout the programming of their assignment, 
are there will be AI keep checking their current progress in the program and then give them suggestion like what we have here from others like, okay, are you having enough comments? Are you having possible mistake? If we add those AI throughout the, uh, the assignment doing process, will that really help students to advance in their, uh, their assignment? So hopefully that is yes. Um, and also I see in other uh, previous uh, question about, um, were DevOps taught under different names like digital build the system, database, networking? Um, do you agree with that? It depends. Um, the focus of DevOps is not about like our distributed or like our distributed system or things like that. The focus of DevOps is okay, we need to have all these things outside. We have distributed system, we have database. How do we integrate everything together automatically? so that things can be done integrated or incrementally without someone keep looking at it. So that is the skills about DevOps. So currently student will do the assignment, submit it, done. But DevOps is about, okay, yeah, it's not done. It's first while you are doing assignment, how do you integrate all the automated testing so that you integrate all the AI or suggestion, everything into it so that it will incrementally grow. Not just that, after the, your software is being deployed, how the operation, the deployment, the distribution, the scaling will be automated so that you don't need to worry about it anymore. So everything, these are the focus of DevOps, which is from my perspective, students were not learning from the current CS curriculum. <laughs> okay, thank you for answering the question. I have one more. So you said that people in education are not really in at the moment. Thanks again, get connected. And um, this is the end of the session. Have a great time at Ixen. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, I want to.